What's attracting so many investors to direct lending? At the top of the list, return potential, diversification, and a widening opportunity set. Speaking of alternatives with Eric Adler, President and CEO of PGIM Private Alternatives. Eric explores the direct lending landscape with Matt Harvey, head of the direct lending business at PGIM Private Capital. Direct lending has been one of the most dynamic areas of the private alternative space these last few years, having grown massively as a source of capital for both corporate borrowers, but also financial sponsors that have kept going from strength to strength and have needed that private capital to foster the growth that they've been experiencing. And all this has happened as traditional bank lending has pulled back and capital markets have been more difficult. This has attracted a lot of newcomers to the space. And so Matt is here to help us understand where the market stands today and where it's going. But before we get into the heart of the topic, let's find out a little bit more about you, Matt. Talk to me about how you came to the direct lending space. I've been in finance really my entire career, in my case, entirely on the buy side, which is quite uncommon, I think, across the direct lending asset class. I studied finance and economics in college, and so in that way, developed an early interest in really understanding how economics and fundamentals drive financial markets and capital markets outcomes. It was really that side of it, the economics side, the drivers and the, and the mechanics of how things work that ultimately led to the financing and the capital markets side for me. I have a family background in science. My dad was a nuclear chemist of all things, so very much grew up trying to understand how things work. And in fact, when I was growing up, I thought I'd be an engineer or something like that. But it really was that background that I think fits credit so well, because we're not looking for a single rifle shot or creative or artistic license on an idea. It's really a disciplined pattern of understanding how things work, understanding in this case how businesses work, and then learning about ways we can finance them over a long period of time. Excellent. So if you had one minute to convince me there's an opportunity here in the direct lending space, what would you say? I think it's really simple. The market is continuing to grow. It, it's maturing, but it's also finding new structural opportunities to finance companies at a scale that it never has. More capital has been raised, that's true, but the vast majority of loan issuance to date sits outside of the direct lending market. As more capital is raised and companies become more educated on direct lending and private credit as a legitimate alternative, that market only continues to expand. The other element that I think coincides with that, and that's where we have a lot of energy, is because it's private credit and privates generally, the opportunity to create alpha from inefficiency, I think is very profound with managers. And in my view, it's perhaps greater in a more durable way than you have at the public markets, which naturally are much more efficient. Information availability is greater. Whereas in the private markets, the managers really can truly create differentiation if they have unique capabilities. When you talk about some of the more recent changes we've been seeing in the market, and you bring up the fact that direct lending is just a portion of all of the different mechanisms that companies can use to get debt capital, how has the rise or the entrance of some of the larger private alts players affected that? I think for the most part, it's actually a case of acceleration. It's created more adoption of this form of financing as a mainstream, legitimate alternative to banks or to syndicated loan issues for companies. The other thing that's happened is as capital has grown, it's also expanded the opportunity set of the types of issues. 10 to 15 years ago, direct lending was confined to what's considered the middle market, companies generally with $100 million to $500 million of revenue. Today, direct lending private credit, as you know, has expanded considerably all the way from SME and specialty finance on the small end, very niche businesses, very niche sectors, up to almost large cap issuers that have plenty of options to issue capital. Investors are often attracted to direct lending because of their specific objectives. What level of discretion or privacy do they seek? Do they want to run a large syndication or have just a handful of sophisticated investors? The additional capital across this market has created more awareness among companies to seek new borrowing opportunities. That's really interesting, the idea of this additional capital. It can be welcome, but obviously with a lot of new entrants, there can be a double-edged sword. 
Every week, we like to unpack a headline, and it's usually a recent headline. And one of the ones we've seen most recently is not all asset managers can handle the responsibility of direct lending. What does that evoke in terms of what you're seeing in the markets every day? What it gets at is asset managers pursuing direct lending from a top-down business imperative, right? They want increased assets under management. It's an end-demand place to be from an investor standpoint. And the macro case clearly is they ought to be in it versus the bottom-up scenario, which I think drives good credit investors generally, and certainly in private credit. Those that have been in the space a long time, they understand how to both originate and then manage these portfolios, which are illiquid, inefficient, highly labor-intensive, and they have the capabilities developed over many years to do it. And so I do think that narrative is fair in that you're going to increasingly see a bifurcation of managers that have proven capabilities, have built the teams, have executed against these teams and capabilities over many years versus those that have assembled or created the strategy simply because the investor demand is there. When we look at our business and we think about where the real value is at, where is the true scarcity at all of this? It's not buying the market, so to speak, and getting the beta premium of direct lending as an asset class, which really is just fundamentally ill liquidity premium over syndicated loans. It's actually the scarcity and how you originate and identify the names. We have to go find companies, find sponsors, find issues. It's how you then structure and underwrite the loan terms. Really, a lot of the value is created in how you manage the portfolio and how you deal with stress in the portfolio. Do you have the depth of portfolio management teams to engage with these issuers and actively manage the portfolio? Do you have workout teams to manage stress when it happens? You could take companies through more significant amendments, restructurings, et cetera. Managers that have those things, I think, in many ways, nothing's changed. The value premise will still be there. Managers that haven't built those things up over a long period of time, or maybe are quickly assembling that as a reaction to a portfolio, I think that's where you can find some stress in the marketplace. That's a big insight. So now digging into the detail of some of what you've already talked about at a higher level, where would you say are the real areas of focus for you and your team And equally, where are the challenges in the space? How do you think about working through these? I think the opportunity comes back to structurally, this is a market where loan supply is growing. More and more issuers are coming to private credit. More and more issuers are aware of direct lending as an alternative. What is more exciting to me, though, when you unpack that is there are really two components of types of issuers in this marketplace. One, where it started, is the classic leverage buyout finance. Private equity sponsor buys a company comes to the direct lending market to take leverage from it as opposed to the banks. And the reason to do that is generally hold sizes are deeper, execution certainty has more clarity, and the financing is more flexible. That market is still growing, but it's also developed a level of maturity in places like the U.S. and Western Europe. What's perhaps different, though, is the so-called non-sponsored market. These are family-owned companies, and the vast majority of middle market companies around the world are still private. They're not held by private equity and they're not publicly listed. And if you have the ability to access those companies, finance those companies with a similar alternative form, in this case, direct lending, with all those same benefits of execution, certainty, depth of hold size, flexibility of capital, but you can access those, which is the scarcity effect, right? It's how do you find and access those? There is an increasing number of those companies that are demanding alternative away from the banks. Because the same fundamental constraints exists. Because banks are under regulatory pressure, they're less and less likely to hold risk, especially in leverage loan format. That makes firms increasingly interested in finding access to this space, which is new ground for many of these firms. So as you know, we have distribution teams. You spend a lot of time with them. They all have their ears to the ground with clients. So we ask them to gather questions from the floor. So let's go through a few of these now. First question is, last year didn't see as much capital deploy. Is there a risk of capital sitting there with nowhere to go? I think in the short term, there is some risk of that. On a micro basis, loan supply generally contracts when the M&A cycle also contracts. The M&A cycle in this case contracted because clearly monetary policy tightened. Rates were up significantly. There's a new cost of capital. In our experience, it takes some time for buyers and sellers to find equilibrium again. And that would define the leverage lending and direct lending market altogether last year. I think, however, 
what's going on from a macro standpoint is back in the earlier point that supply is overall increasing because more and more issuers are coming to this market. The M&A cycle, in our view, this year has already started to pick up. We're seeing our pipeline activity increase year over year in that traditional M&A leverage buyout financing part of the market. And the other thing that's happening is whereas the market has grown dramatically and matured in places like the U.S. and perhaps the United Kingdom, Western Europe as a market is growing in direct lending issues. So more and more share is being taken by direct lenders. And we're seeing it grow in places like Australia and APAC as well. And so in our view, you're always going to have quarter to quarter, year to year fluctuations that are somewhat correlated to the end of A cycle. But overall, the trend line is still steady growth from an issuance standpoint over time. You touched on some of the regional differences. And the second question is drilling even deeper into that. What do the regional dynamics look like in the US versus Europe versus Asia? Again, what parts of those are you and your teams interested as a business? And what are the differences, be they cultural, regulatory, or style of debt and expectations around debt that you see between these three regions? I think it speaks to the illusion that the asset class is one homogenous block of things. And you start with the U.S. where perhaps direct lending is most mature. I described earlier the company size and sectors that can access this financing. Well, if you take that scope, what really has happened is you have many niche and subsectors within direct lending that are actively competing in certain markets. And SME financing is one market. Asset-based finance is another market. And then you have segmentation based on size of companies. We think that creates a little more clarity for investors if managers have capabilities that are very good at drilling down into each of those markets. I would say, in contrast, Europe, by and large, is a little bit more homogenous, and it's a little bit more homogenous because the banking system is still relatively active in lending to companies with leverage balance sheets and holding their risk. It hasn't gone through the same full evolution of transferring that risk to the non-banking sector as the U.S. has. So you do find a little bit more uniformity, but there lies the other opportunity, which you alluded to culture, jurisdictional requirements, et cetera, country by country across the European Union. To invest in private credit well, you have to have local teams that speak the language, have grown up in those markets. It's not that everything goes to London to get syndicated into a capital markets deal these days. Finally, APAC, really, in our case, predicated on Australia, is a pro-growth market. The economic conditions have been quite resilient. You have structural growth in the region, but then you also have very good lending conditions where we have strong creditor rights and we have the early days of this shift from banks to non-bank lending. So how about segment dynamics, pension funds versus insurers? One of the biggest changes in the last couple of years on capital formation is frankly unlocking more insurance company balance sheet appetite for this segment. And historically, take life insurance companies. Direct lending is an interesting relative value investment, but it doesn't do all the things from a regulatory capital standpoint that, for example, investment grade bonds would do. What's developed more recently is you have this idea of collateralizing and securitizing some of the direct lending loan issuance. And through the reinsurance market in particular, it's opening up new pockets of capital. So the market's evolving to create forms of capital that are, I think, more true from a regulatory character because you can get the benefits of diversified portfolios of loans and you can buy tranches of loans that have greater seniority, that are more efficient from a regulatory standpoint. And that's helping to unlock a much broader pool of capital. Pensions, on the other hand, they were the early adopters of direct lending. The return-seeking institutions looking for relative publics or some other form of investment. In some markets, that's become relatively mature, but we see others across the world, particularly Europe and Asia, where pension fund allocations are are still very, very small to direct lending, and that's a big area of growth. So as this industry's grown, and you've talked about some of the newcomers here, one thing that hasn't changed is that this is private debt. There's illiquidity challenge that you don't have in the public markets. So how do you navigate liquidity considerations across the portfolio that you manage? First, it comes down to ensuring that your capital commitments match the illiquidity and nature of the loans you're investing. So when we raise capital from investors, we're very clear that there's only so much customization or overlay of an open-ended nature of these vehicles that you can provide. Fundamentally, we're investing in illiquid loans, and the value in the asset is letting the manager capture that over years, not points in time. You can't trade in and out of the opportunity that way because you can't create liquidity in the portfolio immediately. 
And so from a sort of assets versus liability matching standpoint, just the basic premise, we've got to have vehicles that allow for patient investment periods. In our case, the industry operates on three to four year investment periods. The capital is relatively locked up, and then we distribute the capital over time as we generate gains from those portfolios. Equally, you have to be intensely focused on the value creation after you book the deal. I think perhaps too much of the focus is on the upfront origination and underwriting the deal. That's very important. But we find a lot of the values created actually with the ability for a manager to get to know these companies, the manage, measure, monitor risk. And when companies have either upside opportunities to deploy more capital against, they make an add on acquisition, they recapitalize their balance sheet, et cetera. We're in a place to do that very quickly and efficiently and capture that return for our investors. Or equally from a downside protection standpoint. This takes a lot of experience, training and skill. It also requires a significant investment of time. But teams that maintain this advantage over time can often manage the illiquidity risk premium to their investors' benefit. So the last question switches to a more macro overlay that's affecting all asset classes. That's sustainability and climate requirements. So how do you think about investors' climate requirements? How do you navigate an ESG overlay and make it work with essentially imperfect private company data, as you mentioned? And the obvious fact that you don't run the business, you're a partner in the business, but a lot of this can't be fully actively controlled. I think the first place to start is not all investors' objectives are the same in this particular topic. And and of course, some have very different objectives than others. All that said, what we aim to do as a manager and, and bearing in mind that we're a lender and not an owner, a lender to these companies, not an owner of these companies, is we aim to increase the uniformity and collectability of data. Because from my perspective, that's where it all starts. I can only provide so much value to my investors on managing, observing, and reporting on ESG issues if I have uniform data across my portfolio. Like many things in this particular realm, the ability to get the data and the motivation to get the data frankly started in the European direct lending market. But I would say today it has become a global phenomenon because many investors around the world are very focused on it. So things that the direct lending market is doing now, we underwrite a deal. We have a very specific ESG overlay to the due diligence. We have fact-specific questions that we focus on. We intentionally make them consistent across every deal, every team everywhere in the world. We put that data together and we underwrite and we create a proprietary score for the issue. And then if we ultimately price and execute on that transaction, which that ESG element is part of the underwriting, then we manage and we monitor that score over time. And increasingly, we have terms available in these deals where we can just extract the information better or regularly and hopefully over time with more consistency. The other thing that's happened is, as again, it comes back to capital formation, there are regulatory overlays. Well, Matt, thank you so much for helping us decode an asset class that is at the top of investor priorities today, but is still difficult to distinguish for many of us from other forms of debt. So my three takeaways from what you've heard today on the podcast are the following. The first is that direct lending as a space has grown as much, if not more than any other asset class with a lot of new entrants that have begun to push the risk return envelope on the terms they're ready to lend at. And it's in times like these that the managers with years of experience through credit cycles should ultimately be rewarded for their experience and their discipline. The second takeaway for me is direct loan origination networks with longstanding client relationships can be a real differentiator in a time when so many managers are chasing, at least for the time being, fewer deals in this high interest rate environment that's put a bit of a break on a lot of the traditional M&A transactions and activity we've gotten used to. And the third is how important the direct lending capability is to the rapidly evolving reinsurance markets that has attracted the attention of a lot of the large private alternatives players to this direct lending space. New reinsurance mandates may well be the single largest source of capital driving direct lending growth, at least while private equity transaction volumes stay subdued. So with that, join us next time when our guest is Jamie Shen, head of PGIM's agriculture investment business. She'll be here to talk all things agriculture on Speaking of Alternatives. Speaking of Alternatives with Eric Adler, a podcast from PGIM. Follow, subscribe, and if you like what you hear, 
go ahead and give us a review. And be sure to look for the podcast, The Outthinking Investor, also from PGIM. This podcast is intended solely for professional investor use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments involve risk, including the loss of capital. PGIM is not acting as your fiduciary. The contents are for informational purposes only, are based on information available when created and are subject to change. It is not intended as investment, legal or tax advice and does not consider our recipients' financial objectives. This podcast includes the views and opinions of the authors and may not reflect PGIM's views. PGIM and its related entities may make investment decisions that are inconsistent with the views expressed herein. This podcast should not be reproduced without PGIM's prior written consent. No liability is accepted for any direct, indirect or consequential loss that may arise from any use of the information contained in or derived from this podcast. This material is not for distribution to any recipient located in any jurisdiction where such distribution is unlawful. PGIM is the global asset management business of Prudential Financial Incorporated which is not affiliated in any manner with Prudential PLC, incorporated in the United Kingdom, or with Prudential Assurance Company, a subsidiary of M&G PLC, incorporated in the United Kingdom. Copyright 2024. The PGIM logo and the rock symbols are service marks of PGIM's parent and its related entities, registered in many jurisdictions worldwide.